and we will get started. So good morning, everyone. My name is Michelle Pilotti, and I am one of the California Community College representatives on the Cal OER Organizing Committee. It is my honor to welcome you to the second Cal OER. Over the past few years, representatives of the three segments of public higher education in California have convened regularly to share our OER efforts and to identify opportunities for collaboration. This event is one product of these intersegmental conversations. And it is our hope that Cal OER will become an annual event where we share and celebrate the OER work of our state and beyond. We also hope to meet in person next year. And I say that with a smile because I said that last year, um, but hopefully next year will be different and an in-person um, opportunity to come together will be possible. Please be sure to fill out the survey at the conclusion of the event to let us know your thoughts about Cal OER 2022 and what you would like to see in the future. This event would not have been possible without the commitment of the Cal OER Organizing Committee, the contributions of our sponsors, support provided by staff at the College of the Canyons who developed the event's website, staff at California State University that developed our logo, and staff at the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges who are making today happen. I also want to extend a special thanks to our captioners. We'll say a little bit, little bit more about them in a moment, as well as our volunteers who are helping behind the scene. And I also want to thank you all for being here with us over these next three days. And I have to figure out how to move my slides. Give me a second here. There we go. Um, here are our, the members of our organizing committee. You will meet most of them over the next couple of days. We have a special note next to Teresa's name as she was a really, really important part of our organizing committee while she was still employed by the California State University Affordable Learning Solutions. She has since moved on to a, another role and we miss her incredibly, but I wanna share that she was part of everything almost up to the uh, very end and all of our presenters probably interacted with her um, in preparation for the event. So um, thank you to all of the members of the organizi organizing committee. Uh, and here is a list of our sponsors. Be sure to have a look at the resources that they have provided to you in Pathable and learn a bit about them if you do not already know about them. Uh, we also hope you will share what you're learning over the next few days. Here's our Twitter handle, our hashtag, and the location of our website. A few notes about Pathable. You are in Pathable. Yes, it feels like a Zoom room, but you got here through Pathable. If you suddenly lose access and forget how you got here, that does not sound good, um, your access details are found in an email from ASCCC Sandbox. You're going to have access to everything for a year, so you don't have to rush to type things down, write things down or grab things from the chat, you can always come back. And that's a really uh, important thing to note. And we already started discussing this in the chat. Um, all sessions will be using the Pathable chat as the official place for discussions and questions. The Pathable chat will be archived for the next year. In all sessions, we will disable the Zoom chat to avoid confusion and to make sure that all the discussion takes place in the same, in, takes place, in the same place. The Pathable chat is located on the session page where you click to join session. If you're on a desktop, it's on the right hand side as shown um, on my slide here. If you're using a mobile device, it is below the session description. You'll need to have two windows open to view the Pathable chat and the presentation at the same time. We recommend resizing the Zoom window and the browser tab with Pathable on it to display them side by side on the main screen. After you resize the windows to be smaller, you can drag one to each side of the screen to use both simultaneously, as we've shown here. Um, if you are lucky enough to have two monitors, you can use one to view Pathable and the other to view Zoom. And so um, hopefully you'll figure out which way works best for you. We do have live captioning. Um, uh, CSU Affordable Learning Solutions has funded this. And if you um, would like that live captioning, you can simply enable closed captioning by toggling on captions within the platform. We also do have people that are circulating and can help you if you are having any technical difficulties. So just post that you're having a problem um, in the chat and someone will um, help you out. Um, as I said earlier, your feedback is desired. If you go to the homepage in Pathable, you will find at the very bottom 
a survey where you can tell us about your feelings about 2022 and what you'd like to see in 2023. So our theme this year is open for the future of higher education. We selected this to reflect the event's emphasis on OER and open pedagogy and our optimism for the future, a future that we expect to be impacted by open. While OER is often viewed as a means of creating zero textbook cost courses and as a tool for making education more affordable, OER in concert with open pedagogy provides us with the tools we need to improve edu educational outcomes for all students, to close equity gaps, to make the learning environment more engaging, and to ensure that the resources we teach with are designed for our students. We begin our conference with a look at a statewide OER effort from the other side of the country. And we start tomorrow with a look at what is and will be happening here in California. Our second key keynote tomorrow afternoon will be a panel that discusses the value of OER as a solution with an emphasis on its non-monetary value. Our final keynote provides us with OER related data, leaving, with, leaving us with documented trends to consider as we move forward. And as we move forward here, we look forward to interacting with you in the days ahead, and we hope to meet you in person in 2023. And with that, I am going to stop sharing and um, hand the microphone, the podium, whatever we wanna call it, the screen to James. All right, thanks, Michelle. Hi, everybody. James Glopper-Gross Flag, uh, member of the organizing committee here and also with College of the Canyons. It's my uh, honor to introduce our opening keynote, Mark McBride. Uh, I want to first say how excited I am to hear what he has to tell us today uh, in, his, in his talk entitled, Didn't See That Coming, Lessons Learned from a System-Wide OER Implementation, because this, this is so timely for us in California uh, due to the uh, governor's historic $115 million investment in zero textbook cost degree grant programs for the California Community Colleges, which we hope will also catalyze further investment and further uh, building out of the infrastructure in the CSUs and the UC. So we are all, I hope, listening keenly to what Mark has to advise us about tackling a, a big project like this. But I'm also honored to introduce Mark just because of who he is. He's been a leader, a thought leader in the OER space in higher education for a long time. I'll tell you a few, few bullet points from his formal biography. He is currently Associate Director for Libraries, Scholarly Communications and Museums with Ith Ithaca S&R, where he leads a team of researchers and analysts investigating talent manage management strategies, helping institutions to deliver innovative services to support uh, education and cultural uh, cultural endeavors. Uh, before that, Mark was with the State University of New York, the SUNY system, uh, where amongst other things, he helped to uh, oversee SUNY OER services, which was a mammoth investment, represented a mammoth investment by the state of New York in OER. And before that, Mark was with the University of Buffalo, where he founded the Open Education Research Lab. So again, he's been a leader in the space for a long time. And just personally, I know Mark as somebody who's incredibly thoughtful and generous. If I ever have a question, and I have had lots of questions about different things, Mark is always willing to pick up the phone and, and, and walk me through it. And I know he does this for a lot of people in the space. So uh, Mark, take it away. We're thrilled to have you here. James, thank you. I'll unmute myself first, okay? All right, let me share my screen and see if we can do this without a hitch. Let's see. Of course, you should always test the slides before you begin. But for some reason, my slides aren't showing up. All right, give me one second. There we go, Mark, that's working now. Are they there? Yep, you're there. All righty, all right. 
So give me one second. I can see myself on the screen too. So that's, uh, that's interesting. It's like a virtual uh, uh, background of myself that I'm looking at. All right. Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for, uh, for allowing me to join you today. I also wanna thank uh, James uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, you know, James is a person that I call on from time to time when I need uh, support or guidance uh, because I think that's something we've learned in the um, in the OER space is that um, this is definitely a, um, a a movement. This is definitely a uh, uh, initiative that requires uh, more than just one person. Um, and I also think that's the the what the real power of open education is. It's it's a it's a true community effort. Um, so, uh, as James said, I'm uh, currently at Ithaca SNR, although when Delmar did approach me uh, to, to come and, and join you today, um, I, you know, I was working at the SUNY uh, System Administration Office, where part of my portfolio was uh, the uh, SUNY OER services, and that's primarily what I'm going to be uh, touching on today. But um, recently, I took a position at another organization uh, Ithaca SNR. Um, and, you know, just to give you a little background of what Ithaca is, um, let me see if we can move these slides. Now I see how this works. Um, so Ithaca is a non-for-profit organization and, 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 you know, its mission is really aligned around the idea of uh, expanding access to education um, and, and with, with the notion of making sure that education is more effective and also more affordable. Um, it's a, it's kind of at the heart of, of what Ithaca uh, stands for and what Ithaca is about. It um, actually took its name from uh, a Greek poem. I know no lines from that poem, um, but the, the founder of the organization, Kevin Guthrie, uh, evidently will stop you in the hallway if you happen to be in the offices in New York City and at any time ask you, um, you know, if, what you can tell him about the poem. Um, it's kind of like a, uh, a, a way to, to razz the employees. Um, you know, at Ithaca SNR, you know, that part of the organization uh, is where, uh, you know, I sit. Uh, the SNR stands for strategies and research, and essentially I oversee a research team and we, we investigate, um, you know, the, um, the currently we're investigating some of the talent management issues that we're starting to see in libraries and also in museums, um, but applying a lens of, of innovation in these spaces, we understand, especially during the pandemic, um, that a lot of people had their cheese moved. A lot of people uh, went through uh, significant changes in their professional and their personal lives. And in doing that, they put a lot of stressors um, in, um, in the talent within our organizations. And you know, part of my work is to research some of those stressors and some of those developments in the talent management space within libraries and museums and archives and to, to see where the, the trends are going and to also help uh, organizations make more um, holistic, uh, natural investments in the development of their talent and their development of their staff. Um, some examples of the, our work right now, I think um, you may have uh, recently saw the US faculty survey that came out, a big part of that US faculty survey that came out talked about open access and OER. It seems to be growing in popularity with faculty. Um, it, uh, the, the principal on it, Elizabeth Blankstein, was recently uh, interviewed in Nature Magazine, uh, sharing her insights about uh, the survey and the results of the survey. And here are some other projects um, that we're also in, in invested in, you know, looking at research and teaching practices as it relates to library scholarly communication and also the publishing industry. Um, now, I, Ithaca is not the reason I was brought here. I was brought here to talk about SUNY and uh, my former employer, my alma mater, I was a graduate of the SUNY system uh, where I worked for 16 years. I'm gonna start talking about the, the program uh, that I oversaw the SUNY OER services. Um, 
And, you know, in order to start with that, I just want to also give you a little background on what's about SUNY. Um, you know, SUNY, uh, you know, similar to California, we're starting to see some enrollment decline. Um, and, you know, I think that's primarily related to uh, the population decline in New York State. Um, about half of our students, a little less than half, are uh, majoring uh, uh, in, you know, uh, uh, attending school to, uh, uh, to receive their, uh, their BAs, their bac the baccalaureates. Um, we also have about a uh, little more than um, a quarter or, or associate degree, so the community college students. And as you see, this is how our demographics break down or how SUNY's demographics break down. Um, like I mentioned before, our population is decreasing in New York State, and that is impacting enrollments. You know, we believe probably in the next three to five years in New York State, we'll see this maybe taper off and just plateau. Uh, at least that's the hope. We think that we're going to get a little bit of a population boost uh, for maybe a year or two with maybe an increase in enrollments. Uh, but, you know, the days of, you know, endless amounts of students coming to our campuses, that seems to, to, to have ended. Um, and in the SUNY system, they're probably like the California systems um, in the process of trying to put in a lot of different solutions to, to, to address this declining enrollments while at the same time uh, helping our students. And one of the solutions that, um, you know, that was developed was the SUNY OVR services. So, you know, I'll just talk at a high level of the SUNY OER services is as an organization, and then we'll kind of get into the nitty gritty of, of, of the development of this program. The SUNY OER services is a shared service organization. It's available to all SUNY institutions. Um, and the goal is the, of the SUNY OER services is to help institutions that are looking to build, support, and expand the use of OER programs and practices at their campuses. Um, we, we know that OER helps lower the cost for higher education for students. I mean, you just do back of the envelope math. If it, it's pretty easy to see that if a student isn't paying an exorbitant amount for a textbook and paying nothing or, or a low cost for access to, to course materials, they are certainly saving money. But the one thing we also saw with the OER services, and I'm sure all the people who are, are a part of the conversation today have also seen this, is that has really helped to empower our faculty to start looking at course materials and using course materials that are more um, suited to the pedagogical needs and choices. So the OER services offers, you know, a, a user-friendly technology uh, support um, and helping faculty to adopt content, but also a big part of what we've uh, invested in or what the OER services invested in was the development for more robust faculty development programming. And, you know, I'm gonna talk about that today because I think at the heart of the OER services and the success of the OER services is really um, a result of a lot of the work we did in helping to develop more uh, faculty development programming. Um, so the, the, the OER story in SUNY begins in 2011. Um, it started with a, a community college out in the Syracuse, New York area, Tompkins Cortland Community College. Um, the idea was that Tompkins Cortland, who was part of the Kaleidoscope project, the idea was that if they started putting um, affordable or free resources in the, in the hands of students, they would see fewer drops and more student success because these students had day one access to course materials. Um, they tested that hypothesis. That was the beginning of the conversation about OER. Um, you know, from that conversation, it kind of sparked a, a larger conversation about affordability issues within the SUNY system, especially around course materials. Um, and in 2012, SUNY began an innovative instruction technology grant program that really wanted to foster innovation in the classroom, primarily focusing on faculty and instructional technology. Um, Part of that program, right from the right from the word go, was um, was this desire to make sure that whatever was developed inside the IITG program would be openly licensed. 
we were thinking in terms of wanting to share materials broadly across the SUNY system. Um, and so in itself, SUNY IITG became kind of like a, in a backdoor type of way an OER program and do itself. One of the grant programs that came out of this IITG was something called the, the SUNY Open Textbooks Program. That was out of SUNY Geneseo, which was really instrumental in the development of the SUNY OER services. So SUNY Geneseo, they wanted to test a hypothesis of the library as publisher. So the idea was if the library stepped in to start offering publishing services that would help faculty to author their own open textbooks so that they can make be made freely available to students um, with the faculty's voices added to the text as opposed to what the, the publishers were handing off to our students and to our faculty, they would uh, in turn not only save students money, but also start changing the conversations around teaching and learning in the classroom. Uh, the Open SUNY Textbook Project is probably one of the very first programs out of the, the IITG program that really caught the attention of the SUNY Chancellor's Office. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. In 2015, I know in California and College of the Canyons as part of this program, Achieving the Dream announced a series of funding that Hewlett um, helped sponsor, where we would start to develop these zero cost uh, degree programs at our community colleges. So at SUNY, we had five colleges that got on board uh, with developing these programs where it would be zero cost textbooks and the idea of these fully OER degree programs across SUNY. Um, we had a lot of interest, a lot of excitement around this. I would say that the results of this were a little bit unbalanced, but the one thing, and I, I, I really applaud ATD for doing this, it taught SUNY exactly the right process to begin the conversations around OER. Start with the faculty. You know, a number of these conversations started with the advocates and some of those advocates weren't necessarily in our faculty body. Um, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later as one of the lessons we learned. Um, but one of the lessons we've learned out of the ATD program was also that we needed to, to build an infrastructure. So in 2016, SUNY FACT, which is a, an advisory council to the SUNY provost office, they began investigating what it would look like to develop an infrastructure to support the scale of OER across the system. As a result of that work, the SUNY OER services was formed. Uh, it began in January of 2017. We were really excited by the idea of, of starting maybe with eight to 10 campuses and starting to, to scale um, OER across the university system. Um, but New York State had another idea. Um, and what happened is in April of 2017, um, the New York State government dropped $8 million on the table, 4 million for SUNY, 4 million for CUNY to expand the use of OER uh, in high enrollment general education courses immediately. Um, that changed the nature of the conversation in SUNY. Uh, and it also resulted in us um, uh, learning uh, the hard way, how fun it is to, st to spend state money. So um, I won't go into all the bloody details of what it was like, um, in, in, the, um, in the early days of, of this program. Uh, but one thing I can tell you is since the inception uh, of the SUNY OER services, we've seen over 650,000 SUNY students enrolled in OER courses. Uh, we have saved students um, more than $66 million. Right there it says $47 million, but the actual number is $66 million now. And we have over 17,000, I believe we're up to 19,000 OER course sections. Uh, these numbers are coming in every year as they, begin to, as they get updated within the state. So needless to say, what we've seen is we've seen a dramatic growth of OER across the SUNY system. Now, a lot of what we learned uh, through this program is something that, you know, oftentimes uh, people don't like the necessary talk about in conference sessions. Usually when you hear uh, somebody stand uh, at a podium virtually or physically, they just talk about all the wonderful things 
uh, about their program. Um, but I'm going to kind of flip the script a little bit, and I'm going to tell you about all the mistakes we made so you don't do the same things we did. Um, again, there's great success with the SUNY OER services. SUNY as a system ought to be very proud of the work that they have done, um, but they got there really through um, trial and error. And some of the um, things we learned in the SUNY system, some of the, the, the things we learned through our faculty and from our students is that we, we need to make the, the, the hoop a lot smaller for faculty to jump through uh, in order for them to feel part of the OER conversations. So uh, the first lesson we learned is, you know, when we began the program, almost immediately, you know, and we were a bunch of OER advocates, um, I believe strongly that OER could change the nature of, of higher education. At one time, I believe that OER could touch every classroom in, in North America, and eventually uh, all students would be, you know, taking courses where it would be fully OER. Um, I'm not sure if that will ever be realized, um, but as part of that advocacy as well, I wanted people to know everything I knew about OER. And so we talked a lot about the financial benefits of OER. That was an easy argument to make. We were winning hearts and minds over. Um, but we also spent a considerable amount of time talking to them about Creative Commons licensing. A number of our faculty listened to constant lectures and workshops on the impact of the Creative Commons license. We thought in order for somebody to be a good steward of OER, they should really see the same picture that, that we see in terms of open educational resources. And that to us always began with the license. Now, what we learned firsthand is that that was probably not a great idea. And the reason why it wasn't a great idea, and it was, it was an aha moment where I was sitting in a room with a bunch of faculty as they began to explain the Creative Commons license to a room of their faculty colleagues. And as this panel was going through the conversation of the Creative Commons license, I realized 20 minutes into their presentation, they didn't once touch on the concept of pedagogy, nor did they ever touch on the concept of identifying OER or implementing OER into their courses. They were really focused on just the Creative Commons license and the license of OER. Now, the license of OER is key. It's important. It, it's licensed in a way that, that makes it um, flexible for us to adapt and to change the materials when we need to. But what we also realized is that we were confusing the heck of a lot of people. We were confusing the heck out of our faculty. We were confusing the heck out of ourselves. Um, and in doing that, we decided that it would probably be in our best interest if we would just stop um, all that noise. And we realized in, inadvertently that when we were talking about Creative Commons license, we were really making it very difficult for a faculty member to picture themselves as, a, as an instructor teaching with OBR. We made that hoop so small to jump through they just couldn't find themselves uh, able to jump through that. So our early adopters of the OER movement, like I said, the, the advocates, um, they were easy to convince. Um, I'm of the belief now that for the majority of the faculty in, in SUNY who were early adopters of OER, they may have found their, their way here naturally, even without the SUNY OER services or without Mark McBride, they probably would have found their way to this for the most part. What we were having trouble convincing were the people in the middle, the people that wanted to try OER but didn't know where to start. And we made it very difficult for them to, to really begin their journey of adopting OER. So in the middle of uh, the first year, what we did is we brought a group of faculty together and we asked them to kind of talk us through um, the, the elements of, of OER adoption that would make life easier for them. And nearly every person talked about wanting access to a complete package of OER. They wanted access to curated collection of open content that they could adopt into their courses and begin teaching with 
almost immediately. They didn't want to have to spend a significant amount of time discovering content. They didn't want to sit around spending a considerable amount of time understanding licensing or being trained on licensing. And a few people even commented that they never wanted to attend another OER workshop again. So what we did is we flipped the script and the OER services program began playing more to the middle. So we started looking for the faculty members that wanted to adopt OER, but were having difficulty because of our own handiwork. We made this process very difficult for them. So when we, uh, we heard them talk about wanting this curated catalog of open content, we ended up designing a catalog. In this catalog of the SUNY OER Ready to Adopt courses is available. You can review it. It's oer.suny.com. EDU, once we started um, featuring this catalog in our OER conversations, this is when our adoption started to shoot through the roof. This is when we had more faculty implementing OER because what we did is we made the hoop wider for them to jump through. That's one of the very first lessons we learned was that in order to uh, see more adoptions and to get more faculty invested, in the OER work, we needed to meet them where they were. We didn't need them to meet us where we were. Um, that was a painful lesson, but it wasn't the only painful lesson. So I will share with you another uh, great painful lesson we learned. So we do understand um, that OER is about increasing access and driving down costs for students. That will always be a primary focus of the OER services. And when SUNY began this work, um, they only hoped that these other benefits of OER would materialize. What we've learned in a relatively short period of time is that OER does have the potential for improving the quality of student learning experiences. James talked a lot about open pedagogy. Um, there's also just the, the, the notion that if a faculty member is approaching their course different than they have had approached it before, there's a chance they may go through a redesign process. And there's plenty of educational research that shows that if a faculty member goes through a, a redesign process, more often than not, the students have a better uh, uh, learning experience. Um, but one thing we wanted to do within, within the OER services and, and making sure that we had access to this curated catalog of open content, we needed to find some partners that we could bring into this conversation. Now, SUNY began working with, uh, with Lumen Learning, which is a company I'm, I'm sure all of you are familiar with. We started working with them in 2011. They were at the ground floor of the Kaleidoscope project, so they were always... Um, part of the OER services conversation. Uh, they were like one of the very first companies that we saw in this space that really understood um, this, this need to not only provide affordable learning solutions for students, but also at the same time to start changing the conversation uh, about OER to moving away from just licensing and make it more about pedagogy. So, one thing that Lumen did for the SUNY OER services is not only provide us with this, this, this curated catalog, but they helped us change the conversation about OER adoption. We wanted to make the OER adoption work in SUNY about our faculty. We wanted to make about our faculty investing in their own pedagogy, investing in their own teaching and learning. Um, in order to do that, we had to remove that barrier for, you know, access to open content. So we didn't want to send them down that discovery rabbit hole. So we made this about access. We also made this about cost. So the access was not only for students, but also for faculty, but also about data informed excellence. And what we mean by that, because um, that can be a loaded term. When we had uh, Lumen and also OLI, who later joined on in these conversations with us, we had them in uh, when they implement when the faculty implemented the OER into the learning management system. We had them start tracking what was working in classes and what was not working in classes, and through that we began making changes to the actual OER themselves. 
So we didn't make changes on the OER just based on a hunch or, or based on a, on, a, on a desire we may have. We actually made it based on the data we were receiving from student performance. So if a number of students were, were not doing a, a, a good job in a particular part of an OER, by the next semester, we made sure that that area was changed so that it was more accessible to our students intellectually. Another big piece of what we did with, um, with, with the OER work was also start investing in bringing other partners into the conversation. We knew that we were not able to do this on our own. So we brought in Reclaim Hosting and Reclaim Hosting uh, provided us with access to a press book so that our faculty who wanted to have more of a, a, of a, of a customized OER that they built on, the, on their own and uh, an OER that then maybe built with their students, they would have a platform to start working in that space. We also started working with the Charles A. Dana Center out of Austin, Texas, with some math pathway conversations because we also wanted to fill the gap from some of those gatekeeper courses that we were seeing were really causing a consternation for our students and were, were, were resulting in more students slipping through the cracks. We also wanted to look internally at ourselves. We had partners within, um, within the SUNY system that we could call upon to help with our efforts. We didn't want to make this OER services effort just about the OER services team. We started working with the SUNY help desk and that's where you know a lot of our students and faculty go to get support for their learning management system support. They started working and troubleshooting with our faculty and our students who were having access with some of the open content inside the learning management system. We also started working with the SUNY Center for Professional Development. As I talked about this desire to build more faculty development programming, we went to the faculty development experts. Instead of building our own program, we started working internally with our own experts within SUNY. And those experts helped us inform the direction we were taking um, with our faculty development program. We also knew that we needed to have um, robust research around this space. So we've created an open education research lab that's really investing time and effort into understanding the impact that OER is having in the teaching and learning space. Part of um, what we've also done with um, the SUNY OER services is we've started to change the conversation about what, where we want to take OER across the system. We want to make this about continuous improvement. We want to make this about faculty development and cost savings, but we also want to make this about student engagement in digital learning. One thing we saw during the pandemic, and it was loud and clear during um, the early days when we moved to remote teaching, most faculty who had never taught online or never had uh, invested um, significant amount of time using digital technology in the classroom, didn't even know there was tools like the OER services available to them. So in order for to make the OER services more accessible to our faculty, we didn't wanna just keep hitting them uh, with, the, with the OER argument. We, we began making the argument about digital learning. And so getting them in the door, meeting their expectations where digital learning was concerned was another way for us to begin having other conversations about the power of OER. Instead of leading the conversation about OER, we began leading the conversation around digital learning. And leading the conversation about digital learning allowed us to start having different types of conversation with faculty we normally wouldn't engage with. You know, one thing that the New York State was very specific about with our OER effort was that the content we featured had to be openly licensed and that that content had to target high enrollment general education courses. The OER services catalog primarily features those high enrollment general education courses. That's a real narrow focus of the program, but we also wanted to make OER available and the opportunity available to our graduate courses, um, also to our upper, uh, you know, our upper division undergraduate courses. So although the OER services is primarily focused on that 
those gateway um, general education courses, that first two years of a, of a college experience, we also began to expand the, the, the availability of OER to get to those three and 400 level courses, to get to those graduate level courses. So that now when we're talking to our faculty, we're talking to all the faculty across the SUNY system. One thing we also realized uh, uh, fairly early on with the OER program was that um, we, that, you know, when faculty adopted OER, the students in those classes were starting to perform better in the general education courses than they were in, in those courses where there was not any OER. Now, it's not a tremendous um, increase, but it's a big enough increase where it began to get the attention of a number of our faculty. So coding the courses um, in, um, as OER course sections helped us to also track what our faculty um, or what, how our students were performing inside those OER courses, um, but also it helped us to track the success of that program. So the OER services as a program is successful because our students are successful. Our, the OER services program in SUNY, we believe is successful because our faculty have been successful. And now we're starting to be able to share data with the rest of the world that essentially says, this is the success that we're having inside the OER uh, courses within SUNY. Uh, I'm gonna go back one slide because I did skip something I wanna just touch on quickly. Um, when we talk about SUNY's ready to adopt catalog, um, we make sure that faculty choice is at the heart of it. So when we talk about, you know, what other OER content might be available, we don't have our faculty, you know, we don't tell our faculty, don't search for any OER content, just use what's inside of our, our, our catalog. We want them to start uh, sharing with us some of the other OER that they're that they're investing in. And that is why we brought uh, an organization like OLI in. We had a number of faculty who were teaching um, with OLI material, not using the Lumen material. And that helped us to get another partner in. This is another thing with the OER services is our faculty at part and parcel become part of the conversation about the future development of the OER program, which I think is key. Uh, for any other OER initiative. Make sure that you bring your faculty in as partners and not just as, as, as instructors who are teaching with OER. The other lesson that we learned, um, and you know, this was not really of any uh, uh, surprise to, to many people, is that you know, when we looked at uh, the OER program and we began talking about OER, um, we noticed that, you know, we would go to conferences and we would go to meetings in SUNY and it was the same faces that we would see from time to time to time. In a number of our roles within SUNY, you know, we're also, you know, involved in guided pathways. We're also involved in, you know, work around like strong start to finish. When we'd ever go to those meetings or attend those meetings, um, it was always the same faculty faces. So it seemed like the same faculty were the ones who were leading the efforts at all the campuses. When we realized that, we said that we need to take a step back from always hammering and bringing new faculty into these conversations because it's we keep hitting the same faculty with more and more asks. We keep asking them to do more and more and more. So what we decided was that instead of making OER the thing, we made OER just another thing that could be added to the arsenal. And so what we mean by that is we started focusing on the sustainability of OER, not just in terms of how are we gonna afford the, uh, to, to continue to feature faculty development programming? How are we gonna continue to keep adding more content to our OER catalog, but how are we gonna sustain the employees at our campuses? How are we gonna make them more part of the conversation, but also face less and less burnout from all these initiatives we keep throwing at them? I think at one time, 
when we did an analysis of all the different initiatives that just the SUNY system administration were throwing at our campuses, there was like 173 different initiatives. In those 173 different initiatives, we're essentially falling on the backs of the same people at the same campuses each and every year. So when we started looking at the OER sustainability work, we brought in a company called the RPK Group, and we asked them to help us develop a model for sustainability. When we first started this conversation, almost invariably, our conversations were about finances. But the RPK Group was kind enough and gentle enough with us to say, don't start the conversation with funding. Because if you start the conversation with funding, all anybody's gonna think about is money. What you have to focus on is cultural change. Why would somebody teach with OER? And if they make that choice to, to teach with OER, how do you sustain their work into the future? So with the OER sustainability work, what we started doing is we started talking about those cross campus partnerships. We started talking about all the different initiatives that these faculty of ours were involved in and started looking for ways that OER could be part of those initiatives. So for example, a number of campuses where guided pathways was, was, was fairly popular. We started introducing OER as a solution or as part of the guided pathways program so that it wasn't guided pathways and OER, it was guided pathways with OER. That way we were taking less off the backs of our faculty, less off the backs of our institutions and just putting OER as just another additional piece that you could add to the broader uh, puzzle. We, we, we've tried to change the OER conversation, again, not to be about content, not to be about uh, another initiative. Uh, we've tried to make the OER conversation about faculty choice and about um, the ability to transform the nature of the way people are approaching their courses. Um, and we use OER as just another piece in the conversation with guided pathways, strong start to finish, or any other initiatives that our, our faculty are currently inv invested in. Now, as I left SUNY, we we're in the middle of a major um, migration to a learning management system. We were going from Blackboard to Desire to Learn. In moving to Desire to Learn, there was a lot of onus being placed on the backs of faculty to learn a new learning management system. What we did is we just wanted to make this step into a new digital platform much easier. So we just weaved OER into the um, into the implementation of the new learning management system. So it's not just one more thing they have to learn, but the learning management system, when it does go live, will already have the OER baked into the platform. So faculty don't have to begin their journey all over again once the migration is completed. Making OER part of the uh, conversation and making it part of other initiatives has resulted in seeing an increased OER access, especially with our disadvantaged students. So when we started using OER as another solution into the large uh, schematic of trying to uh, tackle student affordability and student access issues, it, it resulted in students having uh, better learning experience, but also we were starting to see students uh, performing better um, in a number of these classes and seeing a number of students like the disadvantaged students in particular um, adopting more and more OER because, because it became part of the faculty conversation. Um, so uh, like I said, OER isn't just the thing. It's just it's it's another thing in the long um, the long scheme, a long tail of things. Uh, another piece that we started to see was that uh, with the OER uh, materials that we were using, some of our community colleges began to see increasing grades. We started seeing increases in in retention. 
And this is really not because of the OER itself, because this is the, the work of the faculty and the way our faculty were able to roll OER into their teaching performance. All right, the final lesson was faculty development. When, you know, I'll, let me go back one slide. So when, when SUNY first began our program with the OER services, we were really trying to get as many faculty to adopt OER as possible. And what we noticed is a lot of faculty were adopting OER, but they were struggling in trying to determine the best way to utilize the OER in the courses. So when they implemented the OER, um, we saw, you know, some faculty and some of the students were actually performing better, doing a, a great job. But in some cases, we saw a number of faculty really struggling with this change. Uh, we also saw students struggling with the changes the faculty were making. We began having conversations with our instructors about what they needed uh, in order to be more effective in, um, in implementing OER. We started looking at what could be, let's say, some faculty development programming that we could scale across the university system. We began conversations with an organization called Faculty Guild. Faculty Guild was, um, was, was an organization that took that reflective practice that Gail uh, Mellos had talked about um, in, in a number of her uh, research studies. Uh, and they started looking at different ways they could bring faculty together in little, little small communities to work asynchronously a together on their own teaching practices. Uh, faculty Guild was a great success. We had a lot of faculty uh, expressing um, um, joy in the fact that these tools and these opportunities were being made available to them at no cost. Um, but as we, we, we started working with Faculty Guild, we saw some transition take place with Faculty Guild in, in where they couldn't no longer essentially sustain their business model in the way they were, they were, they were structured. So we were at a real loss. Um, Lumen Learning again stepped in and they, um, they took on Faculty Guild, they made an agreement with them, so they bought the IP. And in buying the IP, we were able to continue to scale the faculty development across the system. Now, when we talk about faculty development, and my idea of faculty development was always the idea of like a faculty workshop or a couple of meetings where we would explain the nature of, 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 of open education or online learning or, or whatever it is to faculty. But for the faculty who were involved in these early days of Faculty Guild and, and, and Lumen Circles, their idea of faculty development was completely different. So the platform that we used um, allowed for about 10 or 12 faculty to get together on their own time asynchronously and learn from each other without an administrator overseeing their work. It was a conversation that was really facilitated between the faculty members and then a faculty developer. And that in turn led to conversations between the faculty members about different approaches to teaching. One of the things that we've learned through the OER services, it's a, it's, a, it's a constant theme, is that the beginning of the program should be in faculty development and the end of the program should be in faculty development because one common denominator runs through all the, all the experiences most of us have seen in education. The most important dynamic, the most important um, connection that a student can make on a campus or in the classroom is with the faculty member. It's not necessarily with the course materials. And so if we support our faculty members, if we help them explore their full potential as teachers, then our students are going to have better learning experiences. And if our students have better learning experiences, they're going to have a, a, a better results of, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in their grades and the better results in their retention. Now, we've had a lot of faculty uh, singing the praises of Lumen Circles, and it's not because of Lumen, it's not because of Lumen Circles. It's really because 
our faculty are able to connect with each other in an environment where they're driving the conversation between the two of them and it's amongst them. And so what's what's happening with our faculty is they're beginning to start to have conversations with each other they normally wouldn't have. And they're beginning to work with fellow faculty members that they otherwise may not have had conversations with in terms of their teaching practices. And this in turn is leading to better learning experiences for our students. At the Open Education Research Lab um, in, uh, at the University of Buffalo, we've actually started to reach the, research this dynamic. So at the Open Education Research Lab, we started investigating you know, the, the, the process faculty go through when they first begin to, um, to prepare to teach their courses. So we're talking about even before they select course materials, how do they go through the process of preparing to teach the following semester? What, what was pretty remarkable in just looking at the literature and it's kind of it, it, it held up as we went through the interview cycles with the faculty members. For the most part, faculty work by themselves. They tend to work in isolation from one another. Occasionally, they may work with other faculty member in the department. They actually may occasionally work with a faculty member in another department. But for the most part, faculty work on their own. It's a very insular process. And almost always when a faculty member begins to prepare to teach their courses, they start with content. Now, they may look at student evaluations. They may look at student grades. In fact, they always do tend to look at them, but they don't make changes in their courses necessarily based on that feedback. But they do make changes in their courses when they do bring in new content. The issue is when they bring in new content, they rarely do this um, with anyone else. They do this in isolation and just into themselves. We began talking to our faculty if they felt that with the OER work, they were taking on, let's say, a different process, that they were investing in a different um, modality of preparing to teach their classes. And what we found out is through the OER work and through the OER services, our faculty were starting to have these different experiences. Um, they're called boundary crossing experiences. And these boundary crossing experiences help faculty to, to eventually transform the way they approach teaching their courses. And in a, in a way, it helps transform the way they view themselves as instructors and the way they view their courses. What was fascinating about this work is that we saw OER as acting as that boundary object because in order for a boundary crossing to take place, a boundary object needs to be present. It's almost like the bridge that helps that boundary crossing take place. There was also another key role that was part of this is referred to as like a boundary spanner. So this is almost like that individual or that group that helps translate the, 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 the change that a faculty member may have to go through in order to experience that boundary crossing. And in that boundary spanning work, we saw the libraries and the SUNY system really take a, a, a role on as that translator, as that boundary spanner. When we began to investigate why the faculty were kind of gravitating towards libraries, it wasn't because the libraries had let's say expertise in content. And it wasn't because the libraries maybe um, knew licensing um, better than, the, than, than other counterparts on campus. It, it came to, you know, it came out in the, in the conversations we have with uh, the faculty that the librarians and the libraries themselves were seen as like this trusted entity on campus. And not that the faculty development office wasn't considered a trusted entity. And it's not that the instructional designers and structural technologists were considered a trusted entity, but the librarians themselves were almost like a peer to a number of the faculty members. And the faculty members were much more comfortable starting the conversation with the librarian because the librarian, as the information professional, was also well positioned to help the faculty member find support on campus if the librarian themselves couldn't do the work. We saw that a number of our faculty started having these transformational experiences 
through their work with OER. Oftentimes they would begin their, their journey by connecting with the librarian and then that librarian would connect them with other support on campus. So locally librarians were playing a pivotal role in helping to act as a translator and acting as a bridge to helping uh, faculty members identify other support on campus that they needed in order to be successful with their OER implementation. Now, through all this, at the end of the day, it's really about what our students have to say. And our students, for the most part, who have implemented OER or have been in courses where OER has been implemented, continuously sing the praises, not of the OER, they sing the praises of the faculty member. They talk about faculty members having an obvious empathy for their, for their situation in life, but also that the OER courses are much more engaging. The OER courses are the courses where they're feeling more connected, not only with their faculty member, but their fellow students. Now, is OER that secret ingredient? I, I don't know if it is. I'm willing to bet that it probably isn't. But what I think is the secret ingredient is the investment SUNY made into the faculty development piece. Because I think, and I'm, and I'm a, a, a firm believer in this, that if you invest in your faculty, in a faculty development, helping them with their pedagogy, helping them with some of the choices they make um, as, as teachers, as instructors, um, our students will in turn have better learning experiences. Because again, at the end of the day, the most important dynamic is the dynamic between the students and the faculty. So the one thing we've learned in, across the SUNY system, if there's any major takeaway, is that faculty success plus uh, the st uh, student success has led to institutional success for a number of our campuses. Because when they invest in their faculty, the results are seen by the students and the results from the students show increase in grades and increase in retention. And that, for the most part, is why we started doing this work with the OER services to begin with. It wasn't about licensing at the end of the day. At the end of the day, it was about the relationship that our faculty had with our students and the relationship they had with the support that they that they needed to find on their campus. So um, I'm at this point, I'll take any questions you might have. Um, thank you, Mark. Very nice. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good, good discussions going on in the chat here. We, we do have a couple of questions. Um, the first, the first, well, there are a couple of questions that kind of fall into the category about the relationship between centralized services and individual campuses. One is about the way in which uh, sent, the interaction between centralized ser centralized services and campuses around equity, our institutional uh, priorities around equity or other institutional goals. And then a second has to do with cost. You know, was the cost borne by central services? What's the relationship between the budget of central services and the individual campuses? So I think that's kind of one bundle of question. Then if we have time, I'll, I'll pose the others. Okay, so uh, the first one, uh, I'll, I'll take the equity question. So again, at the, at the heart of this uh, program is faculty development. So when we offer faculty development programming, a big part of the offering is something called um, the, the belonging framework, which is also part of a uh, Lumen Learning offering, but also it's part of uh, some of the, the, the just the, the faculty development, the training we do on the campus about making their courses much more inclusive, making the students uh, feel a sense of belonging in the classroom in order to go through that process. You know, we have to have conversations with our faculty. We have to, have, of course, conversations with our administrator. But again, you know, with this work, we're primarily focused on the classrooms. And what we try to do is we try to walk our faculty through the through the 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 process of building a course that's more inclusive, so that our students have a sense um, that they have a sense of of 
of belonging inside the classroom, but also they feel that they're included in the conversation and that there's an equitable balance between the faculty member and the students so that it's not sage on the stage um, and that it's also not a course that's designed just for one particular subset of students, but it's a course that's designed for all students. Um, and so that's all part of the faculty development program. So it's not only about the most effective way to teach with open content or the most effective way to teach, but also how to be a more inclusive uh, instructor uh, and how to have a more equitable classroom. Um, and then another question you have is about the, the funding. Um, and so brass tacks, um, you know, we get $4 million every year from New York State. Of that $4 million, that $4 million essentially covered the cost of the program. As we start to see more uh, students sitting in OER core sections, as we start to see more uh, faculty um, teaching with the open content that's uh, available through the OER services, there will have to eventually be a cost share. And I know SUNY is in conversations right now with the campuses. Uh, SUNY in itself, um, you know, this won't be my decision, but when I when I last left the conversation was about having a shared responsibility for the program. So the SUNY central office would still inherit and subsidize a portion of, of the program and then do a, a, a cost share with the campuses. That way the campuses have a little skin in the game and the SUNY system is still putting a little skin in the game. Terrific, thank you, Mark. Another question, uh, if you could speak to what specific ways students struggled in classes that adopted OER? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's actually a couple different ways. So, you know, and one of the reasons, and I didn't touch on this because I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not interested in, in, in like the, the debating the merits of other OER uh, programs. But one thing we saw in our program is that we had a lot of, we had a lot of faculty adopting just straight PDF, free open textbooks that they found online. Those are great. Um, it, it's no cost to students. Um, it, it, it removes a major barrier for them. Uh, but one thing we ran into was that our faculty were adopting this, but then forcing our students to like look at 150, 160 page PDF on their laptops or, um, you know, loading the PDF up into the learning management system and then realizing that there was some accessibility issues with the PDF. So, you know, part of the OER services program and, and why we work with these different partners around the digital learning space is because we want to make sure we are making um, all the content accessible to all students. Um, so we really take universal design for learning series in that space. Uh, that's a real primary focus of just digital learning across SUNY, even beyond just the OER services. Um, but also that's why we went down that faculty development route. Even though a faculty member adopts an OER, it doesn't mean that the course is immediately gonna be better. Baking in faculty development up front with the OER seems to be the secret sauce because it helps faculty think different about the way they approach their courses, but in a way that they get support, not only from a centralized service, but also from localized professionals on their campus, like librarians, instructional designers, faculty developers, you know, making this more of a community thrust than just an individual's um, goal of, 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 of implementing an OER in their course and then hoping for the best. Great, thank you, Mark. One, we've got time for maybe one last question. I apologize to those for, who, for whose, whose questions we don't have time for. Uh, There's a question about print on demand at local campuses. Mm -hmm. was, that, was that part of the services that uh, Central Services provided? So initially we started offering print on demand services. Um, it, was, it was kind of a difficult um, situation for us to sustain. Um, for a while, the SUNY Press, our university press, um, that I used to share an office with, they stepped in to help with some of the print on demand, um, but it became like a, a revenue loss for them. So we started looking at some third parties that could 
provide support for print on demand. So if a student wanted a printed, a printed OER, they could get a printed OER, but they would have to do it on their own dime. Um, it's one of those things that, you know, we wish we had a better solution. Over time, there may be something different, um, but the print on demand is something that, you know, we had to actually let go of simply because it wasn't sustainable for us. Got it, got it. And I, looking at the clock, we do have time for one more, I think. Um, one more question. And uh, there's a question about the, the way in which you at the system level or even on the campus level made the case for continued investment in OER. Uh, sometimes we hear uh, people making the case that more, more OER equals more student success and more retention and therefore leads to more revenue for the institution. Is that a case that you've utilized in New York? You know, it is a case we've tried to utilize in New York. To be honest with you, there's so many different initiatives underway, like guided pathways, uh, strong start to finish, uh, even online learning. You know, everybody's making the case that, you know, their program leads to better learning gains, leads to better retention. Everybody's making the same case. Um, and so, you know, we have made the case locally for individual campuses. Now, when you try to make that that case um, at, at the at the macro level across the university system, it's not necessarily heard at the system office, but it's oftentimes heard in the governor's office. And so, I think that's why that return on investment continues to come in from the governor's office, from the New York State Legislature. But when it comes time to invest in uh, a local OER program, it's really that local argument that needs to be made. And this is why we're always drilling home in SUNY. You know, get your get your faculty to acknowledge their OER courses, inform the registrar's office when they're offering an OER courses, of course, and then code that course so that we can analyze the impact of that course and then analyze the impact of those courses over time because then you can make that case locally that investment in OER is an investment in the campus. Very good, thank you, Mark. We really appreciate that clarity. I appreciate that clarity. Uh, you know, it's certainly something I think many of our, many of our attendees uh, do on their own campuses to, to advocate for further investment or continued investment in OER. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. We are approaching uh, the end of the time with you. We really appreciate you being here as the opening keynote for the second annual Cal OER conference. Just a note to everyone out there, don't go away. We have a 15 minute break, but at the top of the hour, 11 a.m. Pacific time, uh, we begin our concurrent sessions. So you all will have an opportunity to start learning about the fantastic creative and innovative work going, going on all across higher education in California. So again, we've got a 15 minute break, but don't go away. You don't, you don't have to leave Pathable, uh, but if you do, you've, you've found your way in once, you can find your way in again. So with that, thanks again, Mark, and we will see all of you in the breakout sessions. Thanks folks. <laughs>